because there's a there's a mountain over there. Some nations will 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 knock that mountain down because they 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 want some mineral out of it, or if they don't like the course of the uh, of the of the waterways, they'll dynamite it and alter the course. Aboriginal peoples of the world, they never done that. They lived in harmony, and I think it's. I think now the world communities are starting to listen that there, that there is something out there that we as indigenous people of peoples of the world that has got something to offer by way of peace and understanding and, and acceptance of, 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 of other world people. And if we here today, we could be a thousand miles away. Take to that road. I'm Camilla and I've been adopted into this Aboriginal family and my spirit name is Warram Ye, which means left-handed woman. My name was given to me by Banjo Clark, a very highly respected Aboriginal elder. This is his son, Len, who looks a bit like him. I've written with Len's father, Wisdom Man by Banjo Clark the compassionate life and beliefs of a remarkable Aboriginal elder. Let me tell you all a story about a wise old man His name is Uncle Banjo Always doing the best he can This was this was Volcano one time and uh, thousand years ago and then uh, you know when the white settlers came and made farms all around the area and uh, and they came here and they wanted that land there too for you know grazing land for stock and then the Aborigines sort of was pushed off right like they was pushed off all their homes no matter where they went they was they didn't understand why the white man was doing it, you know, and it confused their bin because they had their own life and this other life was coming, pushing them away and destroying their culture and confusing them. And, and then they were shot all around the area, no matter where Brittles went, and they all their native food was being destroyed. And, and skins been taken, you know, for clothing for white people. Then they more or less had to steal the white man food on their own land. And then the trouble started, then they all got together and rode on horses and had Brindle camps and destroyed their camps and they ran away in the bush and they were shot. And when they find mass skeletons today, where all Aboriginal bones are found, well, we look on that that massacre because they never had big mass burials in Aboriginal days because they wouldn't go back to that place where some of their tribe died, you know, and move away because that's a spirit sort of place where the people die.
In many cases, our native cultures were assumed to be inferior because we didn't have the same weapons they did, because we didn't have the same resistance to diseases as they did, and because we were so superstitious. <laughs> you know, one man's superstition is another man's religious truth. It's one of the things I admire about Banjo Clark's book, about his writings and his teaching, that he shows that kind of gentle tolerance towards all people, that kind of connection to the earth, who is our mother, all of us, and that understanding that it is through tradition and through respect for our elders, those who came before us, that we may send a good message and give strength to the future generations that come after us. It does not end here with us, but it always goes on. I was told by uh, some Aboriginal friends, in fact, that uh, there have been visions and, and teachings among their people, that there are these two different nations that are separated by an ocean, but they are connected by that ocean as well, that the native people of North America and the native traditional people of Australia share many things in common. And one of them is that our experience here in North America, the experiences of my family and hundreds of thousands of other families, is so similar to that of the Aboriginal people of Australia that we have much to share with each other, much to learn from each other. We need so importantly to listen to each other. We're gonna save this country now. We'll protect this sacred power. Listen to the southwest wind. Listen, can you hear the spirits sing? When our people go on, uh, we feel that their spirits still goes on and we feel that we can be in contact with their spirits and their spirits likewise can be in contact with us. We are saddened by their passing but at the same time we feel that their spirit will always be there with us and travel with us and we are gladdened that we had lived in that time where we got to know that person. I've just been to the funeral of a white girl called Wendy Smith who was the partner of Banjo's son, Lenny. Wendy, having been part of Banjo's family for some time, Aboriginal people felt that they owned her. Lenny himself organised her funeral service and gave the eulogy. Wendy's family came in and witnessed such love and such grief at her temporarily being taken away from them, although they are aware that she will have great happiness in the spiritual realm and she's not totally away from them. Wendy's family decided that she should finally, after the service, be cremated and her ashes taken somewhere else. And so after the service, the hearse took her coffin away and the Aboriginal people present followed that coffin for more than a mile, expressing their love for Wendy, who had belonged to them, this white girl. This is like that old saying, which sounds really corny, but you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And it's when it comes back and you feel the real substance of that, of, of who you are, that you realise, you know, this is, it's like a whole new rebirth. And that's, oh, it, it is the best feeling. Growing up as a black fella in Tassie, and you know, some people, you know, they look at a, someone like me, you know, with, with light skin and they go, how can you be Aboriginal? How can you be a black fella? Well, can you please just sort of step outside those stereotypes just for five minutes? Uh, you know, that stereotype that Aboriginal people in Tasmania, in, in Australia, have um, all got um, 
a, a damaged car in their backyard which is you know set up on blocks and it's got no wheels and you know I have a backyard and it's a huge backyard but it's got no you know demolished car in the backyard the grass will grow nice and green that's the way it's always been banjo hated money and a lot of aboriginal people hate money but he became a bahai and again he realized that it could have a spiritual quality and he was always giving money to people on trains or wherever he met somebody who was down and out. And if a young man turned up somewhere, probably in a pub, and said, hey, this Aboriginal fella gave me all his money, uh, the other person in the pub or the publican would say that could only have been Banjo. He was known for it. So Uncle Banjo and Camilla became friends. And years later, Uncle Banjo's story gets told. And how much wiser is everyone else for knowing, having an understanding of this wisdom man? You know, not everyone was going to be able to meet Uncle Banjo, but you read his book and you know him. You just know him. Of course, the book Wisdom Man is Banjo Clark's book. I wrote it down and shaped it. It took 27 years, nevertheless, I feature as little as possible in the work. It is Banjo's work, Banjo's words. I come from El Salvador in Central America. Uh, my family and I immigrated to, the, to New York in 1969 when there was a civil war going on. And I moved to the United States when I was about 16 years old. And I just knew that my family was well known. And I perhaps took for granted having housekeepers and gardeners and cooks. And I never imagined that one day I would come here with almost just what we had in, in our bags. And there was nobody here to do anything for us. <laughs> So we brought up to believe that we, we're somehow superior because we have money. And if you go under those premises, you can never open your heart to anybody else. Life should be looked upon a sacred thing To be handled carefully If something terrible do you you stop for a while to think it through? Well, my mother was born at the Russian court. She left at the beginning of the 1917 Russian Revolution, and her father was advisor to the Tsar, and so was his father and his father's father, and so on. But the Tsar did not take his advice. And all of the aristocracy at that time were trying to persuade the Tsar to make a government for the people, by the people, and the Tsar did not listen. We always had servants. We had a very formal household. If I tried to tell my parents about hardship of people outside the family, the answer would just be, oh yes, but one's own friends. And immediately, the subject was changed. Anything that could not be said at a cocktail party did not exist in the household where I was brought up. Growing up here in southwest Victoria, um, you know, Aboriginal people were a reality for us, but there was this great chasm almost between Aboriginal Australia and the settler culture. I can remember as a young child meeting um, Aboriginal women down the main street of town here and uh, that was Uncle Banjo's mother and other Aboriginal women so my mum already had a, a, a connection and then her mother before her had a connection where Aboriginal people used to camp on their little property out, at, out the road at Kalani but then when I met Uncle Banjo um, because inevitably 
you go looking for answers or reasons as to what happened here and uh, what happened to the Aboriginal people. And Uncle Banjo was the person who really opened the door um, and let me in and let many non-Indigenous people in uh, and to the story and, and filled in so many gaps. And uh, I guess as a result of that then, our generation has been building bridges from uh, the Indigenous community and the non-Indigenous community. We've been building bridges toward each other. And I guess the great positive outcome of that is that now our children don't have to build those bridges. Um, they, can, they can cross across them freely. The singer Shane Howard once said, Banjo was about the business of saving lives on a daily basis. And he was referring to everybody being welcome in Banjo's house, his house being a haven for lost souls, particularly teenagers who, as Banjo said, they had lost themselves. I'm Barbara Bixon, I'm an author, and I go by the pen name of A.R. Allen. But one day I took the book, I was halfway through, and I took it to my local restaurant. The next thing I knew was a dark, almost black hand went and touched the book. And I was startled for the moment. And when I turned and I looked up, there was a tall man and he had these, this rugged feature. He was very, very dark with a wide nose and curly hairs. But what amazed me was that he had tears in his eyes and the tears started to actually slip down his cheeks. And I looked at him and he said, he was a great man. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And he said, Banjo helped my people. He suffered for us. And that man's face, that man's demeanor, stance, and expression will remain with me for the rest of my life. It was beautiful. My name is Robin, Robin Chandler, and I live in Boston, where we're located right now. I'm a visual artist who became a sociologist later in life. I do research on how art worlds function uh, from a global perspective. So I've traveled on six continents and that's uh, really the constitutes the research sites for my experience. I actually met Camilla Chance several years ago in Australia uh, when she was in the process of, of completing this book shortly before Benjo actually passed away. We both knew on some level that the spiritual teachings of indigenous nations around the world will in fact be the source of the reclamation of humanity. Because if we look at the teachings of those traditional societies, we look at the teachings of Baha'u'llah revealed in the 19th century, you see a spiritual link between the two. Because at the centerpiece, it is about unity, respect, and love. I got a letter in the mail from the International Women's Writing Guild um, telling me that I was to receive a, a book and I was amazed by the story of Banjo's life. It started me uh, on my interest in Aboriginal things. I, then I really needed to go to Australia. They would crank up their band instruments and they would play rather modern sounding music, but frequently the lyrics had to do 
with the suffering of Aboriginal people. I brought back one Yotho Yindi CD. It was called One Blood. And what it's saying is that all peoples are really one blood. And they are longing for that day uh, when that is acknowledged. And of course, we've had now, we've had Sorry Day in Australia. Today, we honor the indigenous peoples of this land, the oldest continuing cultures in human history. We reflect on their past mistreatment. We reflect in particular on the mistreatment of those who were stolen generations. This blemished chapter in our national history. The time has now come for the nation to turn a new page. A new page in Australia's history by righting the wrongs of the past and so moving forward with confidence to the future. We apologise for the laws and policies of successive parliaments and governments that have inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on these our fellow Australians. We apologise especially for the removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, their communities and their country. They'll get guided back have absolutely no doubt about that. No doubt. Sometimes it can take three generations before someone traces that back again, but it will unfold. Sometimes people will have this, you know, you meet someone and they say, I don't know, there's something missing. I feel it in me. And you know. They know that there's someone around them well, it's only when you actually reconnect again and they go, oh yeah, I get it, I get it. You know, I'm, I've reconnected again with the spirits of my ancestors. I am in this role today where I work with, uh, with, with justice, um, a lot of youth and young men, but they don't even know what it is to be Aboriginal. I've asked some kids, you know, what's it, what's it mean to be Koori? And that they really don't know. Indigenous people in general have gifts for the world. It's not a question of feeling guilt for what has been done to Indigenous people all over the world. It is a question of looking at them and seeing that they have a treasure in their midst. And that is why so many of them kept close to their old ways as much as they could, because they possessed a treasure which fulfilled them deeply, deeply, and now is the time to give it to the world. They kept it mostly secret when it was threatened, but it's time to give their laws which show great psychological understanding of people and spiritual understanding above all to the world. With the rain. 